Welcome to Labour Labs. My name is Joseph and on this edition of Labour Labs we are going to be discussing the US presidential election and I'm delighted to be joined by Neem Patel. Neem, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi Joseph, thanks for uh, bringing me on. Um, yeah, I'm 24. I started my first company kind of four or five years ago in, in trading cards and have been growing it since. Um, and so I have a kind of a different viewpoint to, to Joseph on a lot of things. And so it'd be quite cool to just kind of see what, what we thought about it and why we think results turned out the way they did. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, I was, I genuinely, I know the bookies said that Trump was going to win, but everything that I was hearing and listening to said that Kamala Harris was going to win and that her team felt very strong mm -hmm. and convinced that she was going to win. Were you surprised or did you think, do you always think Trump would win? I think, I mean, he was the favourite for a very long time, up until like kind of the last week or two. And then it, for some reason, got really close. I don't know if people got kind of cold feet, people kind of changed mm -hmm. their mind. I, I don't know why the like the polling all the way to the end was quite close in, in the last like week or two. But I honestly thought once... Once you had the assassination attempt, I thought, okay, it's done. Like, mm. he's going to win now. Like, the, um, that image, uh, I mean, after he got shot, right, in the year, that image that was taken where he's standing up saying, like, fight, 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 it's like, it's such an iconic photo, yeah. like, now. But it, it's insanely impressive um, when, obviously, someone's literally just tried to kill you. You don't know what the situation is, right? You don't know if they've been dealt with you don't know if there's other shoot like you don't know what's going on to 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 not hide in that kind of situation show that that, that kind of strength i think mm. straight away the sentiment towards him like really changed i think the other thing that i i kind of opened my eyes to is you know he's 78 right like my grandparents are 79 and they're like good for their age i can't imagine them running a country or like yeah. having that energy or desire to go and do something like that and co put combine that with the fact that he's worth a few billion he really doesn't need to be essentially risking his life to go like he could easily be chilling out and doing whatever he wants. Right. So I think there was a lot of things from that day that people found really inspiring. Um, yeah. 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 It was. And that was an iconic moment. But I guess there was so I watched these videos online and there's people going outside campuses or people's houses and they're asking who you're going to vote for. And a lot of people would say Harris in those videos. So mm. it it feels like. Um, the people that were, you know, would you do you know the story of the uh, the stories come out with that French trader on Poly Market? Have you heard it? No, tell what was it? So I I can't, don't know how much he bet. He bet like thirty million, right, on on the election result on Poly Market. Um, Poly Market is basically a prediction market where you can. It, it got really popular of the election because everyone was using it to see who the favorite was. But he essentially bet thirty million dollars on Trump winning, and the way he did it. Um, I think he made 20 million or something on it, so it was a good trade. Mm. But the way he did it is he commissioned a survey basically to be done in the US and he asked everyone, who do you think your neighbor's gonna vote for? Because if you ask someone directly, there's other, you know, people don't wanna be honest, people don't really know, but when you ask them what they think someone else is gonna do, they're a lot more comfortable saying their kind of belief because mm. it, it gets projected on someone else and that actually turned out to be a really strong indicator because a lot of people would say no, no no I would never vote for Trump like I don't want to vote for Trump yeah but they're like oh but I think my neighbor will or I think this person I know will and that was actually much more telling than asking people directly mm. yeah 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 that is and that's the thing that happened in 2016 as well when people they talk about the silent majority so people who aren't saying they voted for Trump but yeah but did it in the end I guess what surprises me the most is I can understand older people voting for Trump, even middle-aged people voting for Trump. I think it's very surprising how many young people voted for Trump. Um, just because typically young people tend to vote for left-wing progressive parties mm -hmm. and Trump is on the right. So what's your take on why, why young people turn out in big numbers to vote for Trump? I think it wasn't just young people. I mean, I, I think there's two sides of the young people thing, which is one, not as many young women came out for Harris as they would have thought. Mm. And also way more young men came out to vote. Like apparently young men in general don't really vote. I don't know if that's the same here, but in America, anyway, that's the case. And I think, I think what 
Trump and his team did really well is give that sense of optimism and um, kind of that feeling of the American dream back, right? If you look at his team, obviously, like he came for money or whatever, but he's he's done well for himself. But he, you know, right hand man is JD Vance, who came from from nothing. He worked in tech um, and has been, you know, to get to a VP position at the age of, I think he's like 39 or 40 is yeah, yeah, kind exactly. of super impressive. Yeah. And obviously having you know Mustard helps a ton as well, right? Because they're kind of the examples of, um, I guess, like Amer- I know Elon South African, but like American exceptionalism, mm. and they have that inspiration that people kind of want, especially like young men. Like they want to be in that position. They want to be looked at the way that people look at Elon, right? With so much like admiration. I think when you combine that with like the podcast roadshow that. Trump and um, JD Vance did. I think that's really what swung it. So, like, if you look at, you know, he went on like Joe Rogan, and that got like yeah, forty yeah. million views. They went on All In. They like they went on all the podcasts and spoke yeah. for like two to three hours at a time. Yeah, that's why I wonder whether it's. I actually wonder whether it was a cultural win that they had over an economic win because it feels like you're right. Like we want to see people that are successful. Yes. But you also want to see people that are kind of championing the values and the image of yourself that you hope to kind of be and become. And obviously Trump and Mars, they're these people that are kind of big, bold, strident. And so if you're a young man, like you, you kind of look up to that in a sense. Mm-hmm. And so do you think, I don't know, if I felt like it's it was actually the cultural phenomenon of Trump, Mask, Vance and all the kind of um people and and endorsements of celebrities that they had over actually the kind of economic sell of actually stock market crypto economic wealth inflation i feel like the cultural win was actually just as powerful if not more powerful than the economic argument when it comes to young people yeah 100 percent. i think i think i mean they kind of tied together um they kind of met people where they were right they weren't doing all these they weren't on uh, CNBC and stuff like that as much they were on like the Nelt Boys podcast they were on Logan Paul and they were talking about things that would help you know those audiences right so if you're a 20 to 30 year old like guy or girl how would them being in office benefit you and I think that's what they did really really well because they were more specific all of that media by the way they didn't pay for right that was all free appearances like when all the stats have come out now that Harris had a billion to spend versus Trump only had 300 and the Harris team already got in debt like then they owe 20 million to other vendors I mean that's really obviously really not a good sign of like you really want those people running your economy in your country um so just I mean it's a small microcosm of of what they could do with with the wider economy but I think that America's always had that um idea of exceptionalism and that that spirit of the American dream right like they don't want necessarily for the rich to be taxed to give people handouts they just want to believe that advancement and social mobility is possible like they they want to be like oh actually if i work really hard i can get there um Mm. and that's just really unique about their culture that you don't you don't really see that in europe europe's Mm. more to the left which is like you know all the um billionaires and the, the the people that run businesses everyone gets demonized about the ceo stock packages or whatever and i'm not saying the same thing doesn't happen in, in the us i'm not saying it's right or wrong i'm just saying that more people in the us see that as a aspiration rather than something that's like an injustice yeah. and i think that's more productive especially again if you're talking about young men that's what they want to believe that they can achieve and if you're not pandering but if you're saying we can support you in that vision that's going to be what really gets them over the line. Yeah, yeah, no, totally true. But I guess what comes with that is obviously there's a lot of losers. Not everyone makes it to the top or to become an Elon. Yeah, of course. Person. But what they did so well is they made you feel like you can become that, and that's what that's what sells and that's what wins. I think the optimism was was yeah, they really sold the optimism. And now now that they've won, it's about what they're going to do in office, which is what. I want to ask about next which is he's he I find it so ironic that he's talking about drill baby drill and then he also has kind of the 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 king almost of the renewable Renewables. energy uh, uh, 
Uh, so so I, there's already there's so many paradoxes that I find hilarious with Trump, but that's such a key paradox. He's talking about kind of, you know, climate change is, is not a thing, etc. We're going to drill, drill, drill. And then he's got Elon Musk, who is literally driving the renewables revolution. How do you think that matches up? Do you think do you think that's a positive to have that balance or do you think uh, he'll eventually kind of swing one way over the other? I think a lot of his rhetoric's always over the top anyway. I think, I don't know necessarily the situation, but there's uh, a lot of stuff like when inflation was really bad. They, I, I'm pretty sure it was under Trump, but the US has like a strategic oil reserve. During, you know, 2022, when inflation was really bad, Biden depleted a lot of that. And so part of that is like, hey, this is actually kind of an issue for us now, like strategically, like if we're buying all the oil from Saudi or or Russia or wherever, we, we're not in control of our own energy, right? Which is obviously a big problem. And so on one side of that, you have, well, if we can drill and increase our own capacity, we're then independent. And that's obviously a very important uh, thing, especially at the moment with how volatile, like the geopolitical landscape is. So I think, I think that's one side of it. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see like what kind of advancements Tesla, and what kind of impact that's going to have. I mean, Tesla are obviously one of the only car manufacturers that, also manufacture in America, which is another big thing for them, um, especially on the on the EV side. So I think if you, if you look at both of those policies, I think the goal is to basically just bring more money into Americans' pockets. So what other, whatever side of the... It doesn't necessarily matter where you stand on the, the, the kind of way you think ethically what, what, what the, the government should be doing. It's more that wherever you're involved in this, we're going to try and put more money in in your pockets yeah do you think he can deliver on on most maybe not all but on most of his policies like in four years time so in four years time i think um it won't be as bad as what people who voted for harris thought it was going to be but i also think that this coalition of voters that he got put together loads of them will be disappointed the poorest people will be disappointed minority groups will be disappointed and he would have cut tax for the richest in america so they'll be all be happy but actually the kind of working class middle class people that he that he kind of won historically i think they're just bound to be disappointed because i don't think he's he operates in their best interest um and so i think in four years time kind of the hope that americans who voted Trump are feeling now will kind of have dissipated are you more optimistic than than yeah. I am, or what do you think he's bound to disappoint? I think it's very extreme the way the views are. Either either way, like people thought, oh my god, democracy is over if Trump wins, right? And other people are like, oh, this is going to be the you know we're going back to the roaring twenties kind of thing on the other side. And the answer is it's going to be somewhere in the middle, right? It, it always is. It's never as bad as people think. I think. If you look at the financial outlook of, of the US with like their debt and, and how they're actually functioning as an economy, I think under Trump, it's going to be better than the alternative would have been under Harris. So I think that's one of the things you have to kind of compare it to. In terms of if he can deliver on everything you said, I have, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think, though, if you look at all the developments that have kind of taken place over the last like, couple of years with AI and kind of crypto coming back and really these the, new, the next phase of technology, right? If, if, if it was the internet and then it was mobile, phase three is somewhere between AI and, and maybe crypto. And the US has always been the place that innovates, right? That they, that's why they've created trillion dollar companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people, right? That's what's kept them as a growth engine of kind of the world. Um, having a government that supports that and is looking to build good frameworks about that and get that investment domestically I think will help. I think I think like you said, there, there's going to be minority groups and stuff that are hurt by this. Mm. But I think if you look at maybe the alternative, if it was overregulated or if all these businesses were scared overseas, you end up in a worse position, kind of five, ten years down the line, than than being able to keep that talent in in the country. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to end on crypto because. Like there's lots of similarities between the UK and America, but when it comes to crypto, actually, it's not, it's nowhere near as big. So in America, any podcast I listen to, or YouTube video I watch, or even just general 
news websites, they're always talking about crypto. Everyone's talking about crypto. They buying into it. They think it's the next big thing. They think it's the big thing now and they're invested into it. And then here in the UK, you've got some people, people are aware of it, but there's not, there's not the hype that there is in America. I think there was a hype maybe during the pandemic, but like currently yeah. there's not that hype that there was during the pandemic and nowhere near the hype that's in America. What, why do you think that is in the sense that are we just behind and we're going to catch up? Um, and what do you envision for kind of the future of crypto now that you have someone like Trump in office who is clearly a keen proponent of crypto um, as opposed to Harris, who was more measured um, in her support of it? I mean, the, I think there's two things there. Like one, the last government definitely wasn't measured. They were mm. super anti. They were cutting off the banks from dealing with crypto. They were dereg like they were they had ridiculous regulation. They were going after Coinbase, which made no sense because you know the SEC had to approve their like S1 filings to become a public company. And then they went back and said, actually, you're an illegal, illegal business. And you're like, then why did you let us IPO? It doesn't make any sense. So the, the last government was really, really anti and kind of delegitimized it. And I think you saw that. The reason that why the markets have ripped so much in crypto and, and like the crypto stocks is because a pro crypto government kind of legitimizes the industry now. And I think you've seen that with like the ETF flows, they've been massive because all these investments, all these investment bankers and these wealth managers are all like, well, JD Vance like owns crypto. Trump has a like DeFi token, like he has his own NFT project. Like they're gonna help promote crypto um, within the US. So I think that's really good for the industry. And I think that's um, gonna end up being uh, really good for the markets because it just, adds an extra layer of credibility mm. in terms of like the cultural difference i don't know i think like i've seen this in trading cards i think part of it is like honestly just disposable income like salaries in the us are twice as high essentially so mm. people that people can put 500 a thousand you know dollars to work a month and get returns off that whereas in the uk you're looking at 200 to 300 pounds. I, I don't i don't know what the difference is but i think that's yeah. one part of it you see the same, you do see the same kind of observation. You're not, you think it's much more attractive in America than it currently is in the UK. You, there is that difference you'd agree with. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be the same excitement or energy for it here. Mm. And when it does materialize, it's completely wrong. It's like, I'm going to buy this dog coin and try and triple my money. It doesn't, there's, there hasn't been the same kind of like, education or just buying fundamentals like if people are just buying bitcoin and eth and stuff like that would be one thing but it seems to be that people don't get excited until they start seeing it on all the random instagram pages and like twitter groups and then like oh yeah, yeah we can all do this we can all win money and then it ends up kind of going wrong um yeah it feels like we're almost waiting for america to find out about it before we then join maybe we're just less uh we, we have less risk appetite and, and I, I think that's like part of it culturally for sure and i think some of the things that sunak did before uh when he was in office was be really pro crypto um yeah. uh, he's like i think the stuff started when he was chancellor and then when he became pm like he kept pushing that agenda he was really pro like ai getting microsoft to invest in the uk i think he did a couple of good things um for the for the economy and kind of the innovation side of it that i'm hoping that we'll continue to see and I, I'm sure. I, I, in my opinion, I think they'll they'll end up. These are longer term projects, right? But I think they'll end up doing really well, and I think Labour will end up taking credit for them because they'll be mm. like, "Look, under under our government, they did this." Like, yeah, it started two years before that. But fine, um, as as it tends That's to go. Really right? cool politics, my friend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay, and final thing is, in twenty twenty eight, when we review and we have a conversation about the next election, you think Trump will be standing? How would we be then? 82? Do you think he, he'd keep I still going? don't know if he's allowed to run. That's, yeah. I, I, what I, said, I, thought, I said I thought he, he could do because he didn't have successive terms. But maybe he's not. People, since I said that to you, people have said that he can't run. I don't know. Yeah, I'm maybe not sure. I think, too. I do think, though, having listened to a few videos with um, and interviews with J.D. Vance, I think he seems like a really good candidate. So, like, he's more moderate, as in 
extreme on a couple of issues as well but yeah. much more pro <laughs> more yeah more more he's, he's he's toned down in in other senses than, than trump right he's not so much of a caricature as a person um like a lawyer like married to an immigrant like there's a couple of things like on the surface level that you kind of like tick boxes yeah. that you would never fit he in the trump bucket that, that, i hear him say that during the campaign that he thinks basically power phrase on that women are basically worthless if they don't have any children or something like that i think on like <laughs> i mean it could like, have been i mean but that was, that was another really... you, you say that but that was another big thing where like people felt like they would like america I, i'm sure is more religious than the uk right especially the southern states Absolutely. and that was a big and and the and the immigrants right like the the the, the hispanic populations um that they have there that all the ethnic minorities in america are far more religious than i well, they're, they're religious anyway, right? So the more the left kind of pushed things they didn't agree with, that might have been like trans rights, the things that you'd say are like less traditional, the Republicans really lead into that. And I think that also helped them get a ton of votes where people thought that, you know, we're slipping away from what are the traditional values that a lot of people still hold very dearly, especially like, you know, in the South and, and stuff like that. So I think that's another thing that, like, like you just said, that rhetoric is like super over the top. But I think yeah. it would have resonated with a lot of people. And I, th I think like women included who believe in those kind of traditional set of values. That it's not it's not like everyone was up and up, yeah. like, up in up in arms about that kind of stuff. Right. Well, that's the problem with just media and particularly media on the left. They try and kind of take anything that's said and inflate it and, and act like, yeah. oh, my God, this is the worst thing possible. You could never possibly vote for someone that says something like that. And then people that kind of might disagree, but don't think it was the craziest thing to say. Or yeah, like, exactly. hold on a second, because I understand parts of what he's saying. And so then all of a sudden you've almost detached yourself from a complete audience. I think that's what happened a lot during this campaign. Like any little thing, Trump says this, over all of the news websites or, or JD Vance says this, all wild statements, yes, and clearly um, intentionally provocative. Um, but I think the media kind of played into their hands by saying, oh, my gosh, because because I mean, people just have a wide range of views, a wide range of cultural differences. And so there's no one way of looking at things. And I think, yeah, I think the over the top play by the media definitely favoured Trump and yeah. J.D. Vance. Yeah. And I, it, in, in a way that actually backfired, right? Like that, that was yeah. all written in a way that would was supposed to hurt their campaign and make it less credible. But there's definitely a, a voter base that they kind of tapped into with that and and got excited about kind of uh, their office, their, their administration. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to us reviewing what Trump and Vance and Musk and the crew have done in office in four years' time. Um, but for the meantime, thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, speak to you soon. Cheers, man. Bro. Let me... Stop recording.